So far, we've been looking at flesh machines as a marriage between ideologies and philosophies of science and art, as well as a way of talking about organic matter, plants, beasts, and people as mechanistic. This week, we'll begin to explore a different kind of flesh machine, the living machine, with particular emphasis on trains. First, a little background. What made railroads successful in the 19th century was their ability to reduce friction between the ground and vehicles, and thereby facilitate the movement of large and heavy loads over a distance. In general, the harder the surfaces are between a road and vehicle wheels, the easier it is to transport a vehicle. For at least 2,000 years, humans have been cutting, designing, and plating tracks, improving what used to be the stone tracks of ancient Greece and Rome, in order to make way for, first, the wooden wagonways of the 15th century, used to transport goods, coal, and ore in horse-drawn carts and wagons, and then the iron-plated wagonways and solid iron railways of the 18th and 19th centuries. It is only around the 1930s that use of steam-powered engines begins to decline as diesel became the preferred fuel of choice for locomotives and rail cars in America. America and Britain. However, for the majority of the 19th century and early 20th century, trains were steam powered, which means they were powered by the steam produced in a boiler fueled by coal, wood, or oil. We often see these types of trains and related steam powered technology depicted in period pieces as well as genres of alternative history and speculative art, such as steampunk, science fiction, and fantasy. In contemporary depictions of steam power, it is often alternatingly fascinating and fearsome, striking awe in characters and audiences, as well as apprehension of the unknown, unfamiliar, and frequently monstrous. Likewise, in the 19th century, steam power struck many with fear and fascination. Recall for a moment the several dark and gloomy descriptions we've read so far, authored by 19th century writers and depicting technology as alive. One that comes to mind in particular is George Eliot's Shadows of the Coming Race. In this essay, her fictional scholar Theophrastus humbly warns that humans, blinded by their own, quote, maniacal consciousness, end quote, may be out-evolved by an inorganic race, a machine race that Theophrastus eloquently compares to what is otherwise usually seen as that which is just as innocuous and unthreatening as the rock and dirt we stand upon. In the excerpt before us are three important concessions. First, humans are not the only ones capable of progress. We've seen this argument this semester a multitude of times. In Samuel Butler's Erewhon, where machines threaten to overtake the human race. In Julien Alfred de Lemaitre's Man a Machine, where all organic life, including plants, animals, and humans, evolve alongside each other. In Nathaniel Hawthorne's Rappuccini's Daughter, where a human devolves into a kind of plant. In Samuel Taylor Coleridge's To Nature, where a human death is representative of the progress of nature. In Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, where a monster is conditioned by the pains and pleasures of interactions with other humans. And in H.G. Wells's The Island of Dr. Moreau, where evolution is seen as as a process of simplification or degeneration. Eliot's focus on evolution as progressive or regressive is fed by contemporary conversations measuring the values argued between Darwinian theories of progress and Huxleyan theories of degeneration. More than this, though, Eliot is responding to voices of the past, like Sir Humphrey Davies, who assured that humankind will always be the master of nature and technology. Her remarks about technology suggest that humans may become not the masters of machine slaves, but vice versa, the slaves of machine machine masters. Finally, Eliot implies that machines are not to be seen as simply inorganic, but as alive, for they may become sentient. They may come to self-supply, self-repair, and reproduce, and in the end, they may out-survive humans. In the past weeks, we've explored the idea that organic things, plants, beasts, and people may be mechanistic in that they can be taken apart, put back together, and manipulated again, just like machines. However, this week we're going to look at a different kind of flesh machine, that is, the living machine. The idea of a living machine is closely related to motifs of the undead, for a living machine assumes that, like the monstrous undead, it has taken upon life where life originally was inconceivable. Mary Shelley was key in galvanizing this trend. With her novel Frankenstein, she transcended the genres of ghoulish fiction that had preceded her and helped make way for a tradition in science fiction that would explore what it means to give life to non-living matter. And so, now, while we still find ourselves fascinated by tales of the organic undead, we now find ourselves also familiar with stories of the inorganic undead, or living machines. In the stories of today, we'll find examples of friendly and unfriendly living machines, but in the 19th century, this was not so. Machines became another means by which science dehumanized the human species. That is, at first, 
science only seemed to confront the traditional and religious sets of knowledge that defined humans by their soul. For science argued that humans are nothing but matter and do not have a soul, which to conservative thinkers suggested that humans have been stripped of their human status and identity. However, by the late 19th century, such thinking escalated. Machines were seen as literally killing off humans. Karl Marx, known for his work on society, economics, and politics, and usually understood as a founder of modern social science, wrote about what he saw as a sociological fallout caused by increased use of advanced machinery and mass production in factories. He compared complex machines to Frankensteinian monsters, abominations brought to consciousness and life by the steady accumulation of parts. Like Samuel Butler's unnamed writer and Erewhon, Marx is drawing upon the idea here that humans are nothing but complex machines made of layers and dimensions of simpler machines. It is the consolidation of these simple machines into a complex form that helps grant a thing life. In his political treatise on economy, titled Capital, Marx typifies the complex factory machine as, quote, a mechanical monster who fills whole factories and whose demon power at first veiled under the slow and measured motions of his giant limbs, at length breaks out into the fast and furious whirl of his countless working organs, end quote. He's saying that while a single machine may just be a machine, an unthreatening finger or appendix of the coming mechanical race, a collective of machines may pulse together as one powerful body resembling life. And whereas the advanced factory machine resembles life, it also becomes capable of taking human life. Reflecting back upon what we now know as the Luddite Revolution, Marx points out that industrial machines have been and will continue to wipe out the skilled working class. At first, he only suggests that the competition machines generate encourages hazardous workdays. For instance, machines lengthen the workday beyond any natural human capacity and thereby strain a laborer's physical ability to compete alongside a machine. However, it is no mistake that Marx begins his description of the machine as a mechanical monster. As he builds upon these arguments, arguments, he goes on to suggest that machines are brute capitalist demons, stronger, faster, and more efficient than humans, and thus not only displacing many from their jobs, but for many actively destroying their livelihoods. He specifically picks on the steam engine as the autocrat's weapon of choice for repressing laborer uprisings. For if a laborer tries to strike in order to gain improved working conditions, an employer could simply turn to machine labor instead. Thus, Marx also sees industrial machinery as the direct cause of death for several species of skilled laborers, including, for instance, weavers. He concludes that rather than diminishing labor for the working classes, quote, the instrument of labor strikes down the laborer, end quote, stripping him of his means of subsistence and leaving him to starve and perish. Others before Marx also worried that steam-powered machines threatened humans and their way of life. By the mid-19th century, many had mixed feelings about trains. Trains had their benefits. They assisted social and economic progress. For instance, they made voyages and adventures available at low costs, made it safer for women to travel alone, mobilized people and industrial goods across geographic and socioeconomic boundaries, increased information connectivity, and eased suburban growth. However, they also had significant disadvantages. Unlike the more efficient 20th century trains of diesel oil and electricity to come, the trains of industrial England rained grime and smoke upon all city dwellers, blacking out the classes, literally and figuratively. Whole slums were swept away to make room for railroad construction. Wrecks and accidents accumulated, resulting in high death rates. And billowing clouds of smoke smudged the differences between all classes, forcing all towards a uniform dress of dull and dark colors to hide the marks of soot and dirt which fell from the air. Charles Dickens is one who frequently expressed distaste for trains. Dickens is a name that may sound familiar to you. This is because Dickens is famous for being famous. He is an iconic Victorian writer and is often seen as being the very first celebrity of the Western world. However, besides delivering a multitude of semi-conservative social novels riddled with quaint British phrasings and tidy conclusions, he also had a great fear of trains and constantly depicted them in morbid light. In his novel Dombey and Son, written during a decade of booming railway construction, he describes trains as, quote, the triumphant, remorseless monster, death, end quote, a power that, quote, 
forced itself upon its iron way, piercing through the heart of every obstacle and dragging living creatures of all classes, ages, and degrees behind it. End quote. As Dickens describes them, trains are agents of the great equalizer, death and they spread a murky democracy to grave effect, polluting and killing without discrimination in all classes, ages, and degrees of people. As the novel proceeds, trains also take on a demonic aspect, and in graphic terms are shown ripping a man limb from limb and kicking his mutilated fragments into the air. Here is once again the defeat of meaning under mechanism the trampling of the human race under machines. Coincidentally, in 1865, about 20 years after publishing Dombey and Son, Dickens would find himself the near victim of a train wreck where dozens were killed and many more injured. Dickens represents the sentiment of his day. Many of the 19th century found trains to be dirty, noisy, and dangerous. In these punch cartoons, artist John Leach satirizes those who insisted upon the safety of trains. On the right, the caption reads, quote, Railway undertaking, the solicitor says. Going by this train, sir? The passenger replies, hmm? Oh, yes. And the solicitor responds, Allow me then to give you one of my cards, sir. The solicitor is an undertaker, and so there's a pun here that undertaking or taking a ride on the railway implies or invites a railway death. The caption on the left reads, quote, How to ensure against railway accidents. Tie a couple of directors of the Mazeppa to every engine that starts with a train, end quote. Mazeppa is an early 19th century poem written by romantic poet Lord Byron. In the poem Mazeppa, the title character is strapped naked to a wild horse, which is then set loose. The poem was adapted into a play and repeatedly performed from the late 1840s to early 1860s, with a performer, fortunately clothed, tied backwards onto a presumably renegade horse. Once again, in both of these cartoons, we see Leach's argument that to ride a train is to either gamble with one's life or to ride to one's death. And for the rest of the century, going on into the early 20th century, trains would continue to play the role of monstrous machine. In this illustration, Frederick Burr Opper, an American cartoonist, pays homage to the earlier depictions of trains by having his train represent the unstoppable iron will and dangers of capitalist monopolies. Moreover, as usual, there is the blithely understanding threat that the hoot toot will run the common people over. As trains became more comfortable, clean, and efficient in the 20th century, their image as monstrous has diminished, but even so, we are often still reminded of its dangers, as this animation by Aidan McAteer shows us.